I'd now like to introduce Congresswoman Jennifer Gonzalez Colon and Congressman Adriano Espadiat for a bipartisan take on Latino entrepreneurship. Both members currently serve on the House Small Business Committee and they have a track record of working together. In the wake of Hurricane Maria, Congresswoman Gonzalez Colon and Congressman Espaillat introduced the Victims of Major Disaster Act, which provided funds for rental and FEMA assistance to victims displaced by natural disasters. Bob, back over to you. Thanks, Diana. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, um, as Diana mentioned, you both sit on the House Small Business Committee. Congresswoman, though, you're, you're a Republican. Uh, Congressman, you're a Democrat. What are you doing here? Uh, this is not. This is not the script of Washington. How, what, can you describe your relationship and, and, and why you're working together when really it's the most polarizing time I've ever seen in D.C.? First of all, I want to I wanna say that uh, Espaillat and I have been working together not just in this issue. Mm -hmm. And many members of Congress are doing the same, the same thing uh, regarding to Puerto Rico. Uh, I will tell you that most of the funds that have been already allocated are, are been receiving uh, support from both sides of the aisle. Actually, we managed to include more than 70 members of Congress to visit the island in the aftermath of, uh, aftermath of, of Hurricane uh, Irma and Maria, and we still do so, uh, with a lot of, uh, a lot of codels uh, going to the island from the House and the Senate. And I think that's the correct way to, to manage this issue when you can not just hear from the news, but actually going there, looking at what, what's happening. And I want to thank uh, Congressman Espaillat, uh, because this is not the only issue we're working together. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the issue about uh, Puerto Rico, but we are also looking about other ways in a small business committee uh, to, to uh, prosper, uh, to give opportunities to Latino communities. I, just on that, when, what is the reaction of members visiting Puerto Rico? I mean, most of them, uh, first of all, they, they, they are like in shock in terms of looking at what, what's going on. Uh, the first visits, we visit so many towns in the center part of the island uh, that the bridges were washed away by the rivers. We were talking about nine, 29 bridges uh, that were washed away. So a lot of communities were mm -hmm. just uh, out of, you know, out of transit um, without saying something about the situation in the energy uh, when we still, I mean, less than a thousand people uh, are now without power, but again, uh, it was a big issue uh, for the last nine months, uh, the recovery of the power electric, electric grid on the island. So everybody w were uh, surprised in terms of knowing uh, the kind of devastation uh, we suffered uh, with the hurricanes. Congressman, just kind of a general question. What's the, the current climate for Latino-owned businesses, and, and what could be improved, especially what could Congress and the administration do to, to make it better? Well, in, in New York City, there are 268,000 small businesses that are owned by Latinos, half of which are owned by women, and 30% of which are owned by immigrants. So that is that's a very strong uh, and vigorous part of the local economy. But half of them are individual-owned businesses, meaning that, you know, it's a guy with a toolbox that does provides a certain service that doesn't have the solid infrastructure nor the, the employees to, to perhaps take that business to the next level. Mm -hmm. As such, right, I think that business needs help, and so they need access to capital. The problem is that the traditional banks want you to have A-plus credit rating. They want you to be able to make payroll when you have employees, and they want you to have liquidity. And if you have that, the bank comes to you. You don't need to go to the bank. Uh, what you need to have is access to, to capital to a business that's fragile, that needs that little extra push, right, to get them to the next level. The other, the other uh, problem is that the laws and the regulations are so complicated that they often make mistakes. And so uh, if rent is a big issue to small businesses in New York City, for example. So when they're going to go through a lease and enter a lease agreement with the landlord, they don't go, they don't go to a, 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 an attorney, a real estate attorney. They go to an immigration attorney. So they often sign a lease that's not benefit, that doesn't benefit them short or long term. Uh, energy costs, right? Some of the bodegas have these old fashions, I'm sure you've seen them, refrigeration equipment. They look like a dinosaur and they sound like a dinosaur. <laughs> 
you know, I worked with Canis and the local utility company in New York City, and we helped retrofit when I was in the state government. 600 businesses with smart energy refrigeration equipment and other equipment, reducing their energy costs by as high as 50%. Some bodegas save $1,500, even $3,000 a month. That's a real savings in their pocket. So I think small businesses have to overcome this bureaucracy, and it's, it's such a burden to deal with the federal government that they just stay away. And so we're, we're disconnected from the small business community in a practical way. Let's bring them help in their pocket. You'll see them come. And so that's the greatest challenge. How do we access them? What kind of help do we provide them on a day-to-day -day basis so that they can go to the next level and then they could engage the federal government for contracts, subcontracts, et cetera? Uh, Congresswoman, you can't really have a discussion about the economy without talking about the, the new tax law. What, what are your constituents saying? Uh, there have been a, uh, basically this is on the agenda for the election. Uh, the midterm is going to be about, in large part, uh, the tax law and whether you agree with it or not. Um, what are your constituents saying about it? Well, first of all, I think the, the last uh, tax reform provided for uh, a better understanding of the businesses alike, and you're seeing the, the economy growing in all, all the United States, actually. Uh, not just the unemployment rate is going down, but less than 4%. In the case of Puerto Rico, it's 9.9% .9 of unemployment. Uh, so there's a big gap uh, over there. And, and, and of course, um, industries were supporting that, that tax reform, and that is provided more revenues uh, and created more private jobs, in, 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 of course, in the private sector. Um, in the case of Puerto Rico, we managed to include uh, two provisions. One is uh, opportunity zones uh, that led Puerto Rico uh, to capitalize some investment in, in the uh, real estate area uh, that will promote not just tourism, but in, in research uh, and housing that is so important in, in many areas that we still got a lot of uh, vacancies. Uh, the global report just said that Puerto Rico got 9.9% of depreciation uh, on the property value. The second uh, country or state that is ahead on that list is Russia, with 7%. Uh, so that will tell you how, how bad the situation is in the island in terms of investments. Uh, the other provision that we managed to include, and, and this was part of a bipartisan effort for the employers uh, uh, during the hurricane season, most of them are employers continue to pay uh, their employees even when they were not working. Uh, so we managed to include with Representative Curvello mm -hmm. uh, an amendment, and Stacy Plaskett from the Virgin Islands, an amendment to provide uh, a reimbursement uh, to all those employers, uh, in, of course, uh, without any limitation, even the ones that uh, uh, are uh, creating revenue from more than $10 million or less than $10 million per employee, up to, up to uh, $2,000. Uh, so this is a kind of, uh, kind of a, uh, a way of saying thank you and invest and man maintain your, uh, your wages and, and your uh, em em employment role, uh, role, uh, roster. Um, so those are two of the provisions. We're still working in a new provision for um, economic development on the island, including distress zones and empowerment zones. Uh, that will help us out uh, to manage uh, some of the provisions that were included uh, to the island. Uh, and again, uh, the situation uh, in, in, in the case of Puerto Rico sh should be an option uh, to provide tools for economic development on the island. Our economy, we exported more than $71 billion in the, in the year 2016. And we imported uh, more than $41 billion. Actually, we import 80% of what we consume. Uh, so that will tell you how important for the economy is having those tools to, to let uh, some uh, improvement there. Uh, Congressman Espaillat, I, I uh, talked to Congressman Corbello. Uh, he's not a fan of uh, abolishing ICE. You have legislation on this issue. Um, do you, number one, why do you think it should move and do you think it would move if the House flips to the Democrats next year? Because I think what's happening at the border is a human rights crisis. And ICE is an agency that has broad jurisdiction, as broad as, for example, uh, dealing with drug trafficking, illegal arms, uh, human trafficking, sex trafficking. And now they diverted their attention from all of these very important law enforcement traditional responsibilities to arrest a mom and separate her from her children. And so 
I think that ICE has detoured from their real mission, and I think we should have a separate entity, and we, we have separate agencies like ATF and DEA. They concentrate only in alcohol, tobacco, and firearms or drug enforcement. We should have one just for immigration that enforces the law but has a heart, and ICE is heartless right now. And is that what kind of what kind of feedback are you getting from your constituents on oh, this? Oh, tremendous! And, and and from the members of Congress, I think that there's growing support uh, to do that. I think it's uh, a mistake to think that we're trying to gut out this uh, important agency that has a role to play. We want to redefine it and establish a new one that again will ensure that the, the immigration laws are enforced, but that you don't separate a mom from her nine-month baby that is breastfed. That's a human rights crisis, and that's why the United Nations, a Human Rights Watch, uh, Amnesty International, the Catholic Conference of Bishops have all condemned that practice. So that's why we should abolish uh, ICE. Congressman, how would you grade the Trump administration on um getting Puerto Rico back on its feet? I mean, it, it's been a, uh, it's gonna take a long-term uh, recovery, and, and that's a reality, but let me tell you something that many people are not aware of. This is the first time ever we got the federal agencies on the island before, during, and after the hurricane. And that's uh, for FEMA, that's for the Army Corps of Engineers, and for, for the rest of the agencies. We never got that before. So this is the first uh, hurricane season that we actually got uh, people on the ground before and during after the two hurricanes. Uh, I think that the, the first thing everybody will agree on is, is the red tape in, in most of the agencies to get things out and to get things done. Um, I will say that in terms of Congress, I, I, was, I was surprised and, and and grateful uh, that my colleagues in the House and in the Senate from both sides of the aisle provided me uh, with the resources uh, that are so important for that recovery process. Uh, we were talking at this time of more than $35 billion uh, that are being allocated to the island in different areas. We're talking about agriculture, we're talking about housing, and, and housing is actually at this time the biggest problem when you got half of the population uh, building without, without permits, uh, and a lot of those people, folks, uh, still having blue, blue tarps on their houses, and we are already in the hurricane season. Um, most of them, the funds also in the Corp of Engineers to mitigation in terms of the floods and the rivers that we're still facing. And actually, uh, just last week, we announced $2.5 billion to that mitigation uh, to the Army Corps of Engineers of to, to many rivers. So, I mean, the situation, we never expected to be in a complete blackout. Uh, no water, no power, no telecom, uh, no entrance to the ports, to the airports. That, that, that was our situation. It was like a state of war. Uh, after the hurricane, uh, but people in Puerto Rico are very resilient, and uh, we don't take a no for an answer. Uh, I'll tell you that. Um, and uh, we've been receiving um, all the things that we've been asking, the waivers uh, to comply with many federal laws that uh, maybe delay a lot of the uh, resources to the island are being are being waived. Uh, of course, we continue to do so. As a matter of fact, we file uh, a bill together in terms of uh, providing uh, FEMA aid uh, to uh, the people that do not have their title uh, or their deeds for, from their home. Uh, and that's a big problem that people suffer uh, still uh, on the island. But this is an ongoing situation. Of course, there are a lot of issues that should be um, uh, taking uh, those examples uh, to change in the future, future, not just for Puerto Rico, for the rest of the nation. Uh, one of those, of course, as an island, uh, the way the help uh, was arriving, I mean, it took several days. Uh, because different to Texas or Florida, you can't have trucks or trains uh, delivering the goods. And, and that's, of course, our main, our main challenge. Uh, but again, uh, we still are in an emergency mode. Mm -hmm. uh, when you still got issues about the, re the resiliency of, of the power grid, uh, still people without power. Uh, mm -hmm. Now everybody got, got water in the island, but again, it's still a, a long, it will be a long process. I mean, we're still building and rebuilding roads uh, that were washed away by the rivers. And I think the biggest problem right now uh, is the suicide rate. I mean, we got a mental issue uh, about 
post-traumatic disorder in the island, and we need to address that issue with the, not, that, not just the federal agencies or local agencies, but a lot of NGOs and professionals on, on the island, because that's a big problem that we still have in now. So it's not just about the money, it's how to deal uh, with the complete uh, problem uh, that we, we faced and we are praying. Uh, not to receive uh, another another hurricane. The last example, it was on Monday, uh, when um, a storm burial uh, was announced to the island, and everybody were were going to the supermarkets uh, just to to take everything from the shelves. So that's the kind of uh, way we're living, and we're not used to that. You mentioned getting members of Congress to go before the uh, to Puerto Rico to see the devastation before the 2008 election. We noticed that a, a lot of uh, would-be presidents who were certainly thinking about running for president had been to Iowa, had been to South Carolina, had been to New Hampshire, but had not been to the Gulf Coast. And so Senator uh, Mary Landro at the time uh, really pressed uh, them to, to visit, and as, after our story ran, then several of them did. Um, will you press the 2020 hopefuls to see the devastation? Yeah, definitely. I mean, and we still continue to, to receive a lot of members from both sides of the aisle. Um, and what we're looking at is it's not just the commitment on words, in actions. Uh, because most of the members, uh, even when they're going there and they make, you know, uh, they make a call of what's happening in Puerto Rico, then when the bills come to the floor, they're not voting it for, for it. So, I mean, you, you need to accompany that word with commitment and an actual uh, work. And again, uh, this hurricane was not for Republicans or Democrats. It was the people who got affected. Uh, so I think one of the biggest, and I want to thank, thank, I want to say thank you for all the states and all the people, NGOs, uh, and all, all the people who were helping and still are doing so uh, with the island. And again, uh, I know with, that we're going to recover. Uh, we are now facing uh, the next step about how to uh, how to help our power grid, which is so fragile as we speak, without saying nothing about the fiscal situation in the island, uh, that, that's another, another whole story. Congressman, um, uh, as Congressman Cabello mentioned, the, the Dreamer issue is kind of stuck in the courts right now, and Congress without a deadline doesn't really do much, and so there has been this lack of a deadline. But do you, what do you see going forward on immigration? Mm -hmm. It's been so difficult, uh, every Democrat uh, voted against both those proposals uh, that were voted on recently that went down on the House floor. Very odd to see uh, legislation in the House go down. Um, but do you think that maybe after the election that the, the, the parties can come together and reach some, some type of agreement, at least on DREAMers? I hope they do it before because uh, DREAMers have captured the support of eight, over 80, as, as high as 86 percent of the population in red state and in blue states and Republican districts and in Democratic districts, Americans are inspired by dreamers and, and they feel overwhelmingly that they should stay here. Uh, yes, as they were in, uh, concerned and troubled by hearing small children cry for their moms in the middle of the night, uh, uh, propelling the administration to backpedal immediately on this separation issue. So these two issues have captured the soul and the heart of the American people. The problem is that the administration, in order to address the dreamers or the family separation issue, want, want to saddle the debate with very toxic provisions. For example, the elimination of 40 percent of legal immigration. What does that mean? They want to reshape what I feel is family reunification. That's how I got here. My grandmother petitioned for us. That's not uh, chain migration. That's family reunification. We lived in the same apartment for seven years. That made us stronger. That made the neighborhood and the country stronger. So he wants to change that dramatically. He wants to also um, uh, uh, eliminate diversity visas, which are the, the, the strong vertebrae column of, of uh, making the country a melting pot getting people of color from sub-Sahara Africa, from El Salvador, from Haiti to come to the United States. So they want to saddle, and of course, $25 billion for the wall. They want to saddle the dreamers issue and the family reunification issue, or rather the, the family separation issue, with these toxic provisions that make it impossible to reach a consensus. 
if uh, people in Republican districts and in Democratic districts feel that Dreamers should stay, let's talk about that separately and let's pass it. If people are having nightmares at night because they hear these moms crying and their, their children asking for them in the middle of the night, well, then let's bring them together without having to have a, a broader debate about comprehensive immigration reform. You should have that debate, but not at the expense of dreamers of these moms that want to get together back with their children. So there is no genuine effort from the White House to bring a resolution to it as long as they continue to put these poison pills in the middle of the debate. And so that's the great concern that we have right now. And of course, uh, the country, I think, is very supportive of DREAMers, as they should be. They're doctors, they're, they're teachers, they're members of our armed forces that, that ultimately are willing to put their life on the line for our nation. And yet we're telling them, no, you got to go back to where you came from. I think that's un American. Is, is the wall a deal breaker? We already have walls. And if, the, if what you mean by the wall is a port of entry that's very antiquated and needs to be modernized, I'm with that. I, 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 most of the guns and most of the drugs and the illegal trafficking come through these ports of entry. Let's make them stronger. But if, if, if the central piece of the argument is to bring up another barrier similar to what the, 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 the Berlin Wall was, uh, that is a, a thing of the past, really. Uh, technology, we're talking about small businesses here. Technology has brought the planet together. Uh, Jennifer and I are cousins. We're Caribbeans. Maybe in the old days. We danced merengue. We danced merengue and salsa, <laughs> right? And every once in a while, we throw in a little cumbia, too. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the world is coming together, and we want to build up walls. Please. And at a $25 billion clip for the budget, I think, is, is, is a thing of the past. We should, be, we should enforce immigration law, but we should do it with a heart. We've run out of time. Please thank uh, our two lawmakers for joining us this morning, and I'll hand it back to Diana. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really good. Well done. Well done. Thank you.